So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith is uh, a, a psychologist, and uh, but with uh, a impressive uh, production of uh, publication. Uh, so he has a master, have master in physiology and uh, um, psycho, no, psychological physiology. So. Very, and uh, biopsychology and very uh, heterogeneous uh, formation, I think. And um, at the moment, is a senior research um, psychology at the Center for Psychiatric Research in Denmark. And uh, so the title of the presentation is uh, uh, Molecular Brain Imaging by Positron Emission Tomography. Thank you very much for that introduction. And I'd like to thank Dr. Vendelli and Dr. Tosi for giving me the opportunity to come here. I'm here today because you people are here today. I am interested in applying the nanoparticle research that you are all involved with for brain imaging. And I'm together with you all, searching for magic nanobullets that can do things that we can't currently do. I've come actually to Modena to ask everyone for help because we have not come nearly as far as we should be in neuroscience imaging. Most of the things that go on in the brain cannot now be studied in the living brain of the human. And there's reasons for this that I'll get into. One of the ideas of this meeting has to do with asking questions. And I received an email just before coming when I was, had prepared a 20-minute talk, and it said, please reduce your talk to 10 minutes because we want questions. So uh, I'm going to ask a question. The gentleman in the blue shirt sitting there, yes, you, sir, can you tell me what this shows? The lady be sitting beside, do you know what it is? Um, if you know, raise your hand. Okay, that's what I thought, and that's what I was hoping, so then I have other things I can tell. This is a pet brain image of a pig showing, let me find my mouse, it's over here. This is a... Uh, Trans this is a sagittal cut through the brain, this is a transaxial cut, and this is a coronal cut through the brain. The brain is here, but there's nothing happening with the radioactivity. Nothing has entered the central nervous system. This is the rule and not the exception for pet radiochemistry. The medicinal chemists and so on produce compounds that they test in one system after another. They know the binding of this in the test tube. They know the KMs and the Bmaxes. And then our radiochemists or others all over the world get their hands on these compounds, put a positron-emitting molecule in to the molecule. You put some positron emitting radionuclide in. It goes into the body. If it hits an electron, then they disintegrate and you get a photon emission in two opposite directions and you can measure this by PET. But the sad story is it doesn't usually work. With respect to Parkinson disease, we're lucky we have tracers that can do Parkinson disease. The strong point for PET is that we use very, very, very small doses, and we give one injection. So the nanoparticles can be produced and labeled at very, very low amounts and probably, probably will not cause any toxicity if the dose is low enough. We have real-time recording. We have short-lived radionuclides so that they're gone in an hour or four or five hours. They're gone. It's organic chemistry. 
its molecular imaging with PET as opposed to other types of very important but not molecular imaging. We can label our molecules directly, and we have a relatively high spatial resolution. These are the strong points. But the weak points, boot, left mouse, down, have to do with finding out what's going on in the brain. My main reason for coming to Denmark when I was finished at the University of Chicago as a doctoral fellow was to study lithium therapy of mania and depression. Aarhus in, the United, in Denmark is or was the world center for lithium therapy. And I was sent there by the National Institute of Mental Health for two years to study with Professor Moen Sko on lithium therapy. Since then, we've been involved in all aspects of affective disorders, and these are some of the symptoms. This drawing is done by one of the patients of the psychiatric hospital. There's a big art center at the hospital, and this represents a woman in a depressed state. And we know next to nothing about what's going on in the brain of a person in that condition. The major goal of biological psychiatry is to discover valid procedures for evaluating neurochemical dysfunctions associated with various neuropsychiatric disorders. The major goal is to invent reliable tools for evaluating these dysfunctions. This little compound is a compound called on the market mirtazapine. It was made by Organon many years ago in the 80s. It's used as an antidepressant. It has a very rapid sedative action that many of our patients appreciate because they can't sleep, they fall asleep, they wake up with nightmares, and they wake up very early and are very disturbed. And our chemists, we had a visiting chemist from um, Budapest, and she labeled this compound with carbon-11. And uh, it's a multi-receptor compound, but it was in our pipeline of compounds. And at this point, I have to mention, in 1992, the PET center appeared in Aarhus, and my chief at the psychiatric hospital said, why don't you go over and speak to the people there? And I've been there ever since. We've studied at least 12 different antidepressant drugs that have been labeled for PET. This is the only one that is in clinical use that is usable for PET. Either they go too slowly into the brain or they go so rapidly in that they label the fat tissue and the cells and the astrocytes and everything. So either you get no image or you get a big sunshiny image that you can't find around in. If you do this in a human and you inject that compound intravenously, you get curves depending on the brain regions, and you can identify brain regions in a human for the mirtazapine binding. This was a relatively big step at the time, and uh, in order to try to use it for scientific benefit and maybe patient benefit, we designed a study where we um, were able to recruit a bunch of healthy, never-depressed people and a group of treatment-resistant depressed people that had stopped taking drugs because they didn't work, nothing worked, and they were having side effects of the drugs. So we did a study with mirtazapine uh, last year. This was published last year. And the only thing we could see was a slight reduction of the binding in certain areas, mainly in something called the anterior commissure, that is a decision-making region in the middle of the human brain. This is the only study of treatment-resistant depressed people by PET. Um, other people have used other tracers, but none of them are any good. This is a um, conclusion from our recent review article on everything that has been done in the last six years. Recent research has neither proved nor refuted the idea that neuromolecular processes that can be assessed by radioligands available for PET are causally related to depressive disorders. 
The future success of pet research for understanding these mechanisms requires the in- invention and development of further molecular tools for testing a wider range in the brain. When we're working at the basic research level, because of the size of the PET scanners and because of the very similarity of the brain and the heart and the circulatory system of a pig, these are our test animals. They're our guinea pigs. We treat them as we would treat uh, young people that would be prepared for surgery. They're monitored completely with blood pressure and we have to do pain tests all through the time. We do everything, we take blood samples and uh, the other end of the pig looks like this in the PET scanner. It's the part of the body that you want to scan that should be immobilized and this is a head holder that we made years ago to hold the pig's head. This is what you can get out of PET when you have a completely new compound and you want to know where it's going. I envision doing this whole body scanning with nanoparticles that are labeled with new PET tracers. In a minute, well, it doesn't take a minute, it takes 45 minutes, you can identify the complete distribution of these radio tracers throughout the body. We also have a micro PET equipment that can do rats and small animals. In a pig, you can get curves like this for the different brain regions, and then you apply kinetic um, models to determine the binding potential or the volume of distribution, depending on what sort of a system you're working with. So this is, um, I think this is Yohim beam, which is an alpha-2 antagonist in the pig brain. But as I showed you at the beginning, that's what looks the way we all want it to look. And this is what it looks like when it's not working because the compound's not entering the brain. And sometimes the metabolism of the compound is very, very fast. We would love to protect it with nanoparticles. So the blood-brain barrier restricts the entry of potential PET tracers, and it rapid metabolism and the blood-brain barrier prevent us from studying more or less all of the molecular mechanisms that we know in one way or another exist in the brain. There are very few suitable PET tracers, so we need some magic nano bullets to be carriers for this. And I've come down here to encourage you to develop these nano bullets and share them with scientists like myself Um, The compound that I want to do next is the radio-labeled L-thymidine. And uh, I'd like the the, uh, chairman or chairwoman to give me a little feedback on time. I only have like three more slides, but how much time do I have? Do you have an idea? Um, Two minutes, three minutes? Not much time. Okay. All right. I'm not so terribly concerned. They've been moved ahead to speak because I have to take the bus to the airport to get back to Denmark later today. But I have an hour or so to be. If the blood-brain barrier is broken by a cancer in the brain, then this special compound enters the cancer and can identify the cell division. I visited the Hammersmith Hospital where you're using this compound especially for experimental research on breast cancer. They had women that had been through various therapies and the therapies hadn't helped at all. The cells were complete, continuing to divide. So they did a PET scan with this and then they went in an experimental treatment for two weeks and then they were PET scanned again and this compound could show that cells were stopped in their division and that's what I want to know. The present idea of depression literature has to do that there are certain areas of the brain where the cells aren't dividing properly. So the person's mental capacity is not being kept up and this might contribute to depression. We know in animals if we inject antidepressant drugs we get a better cell depression, uh, cell production, and if we give uh, other treatments we can get an increased cell Um, production, but we can't do this in the intact brain. 
the um, compound enters the sequence. Okay, there it is. It's moving. The FLT is visible here, 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 here. That's what I do at my office when it doesn't follow me. Okay, um, this is the FLT. It goes into the thymidine kinase. And when the cell is dividing, you get a S1 cycle happening, and then this molecule labels the, um, the thymidine kinase. The transport systems have been reviewed very carefully by the group here. This is one of the areas that I know less or maybe least about. I'm a neuropsychopharmacologist, but these transport systems I know next to nothing about, in fact. But my idea is if we take a peek, a sneak preview into PET imaging in the future, it would probably look something like this where we'll have targeted nanoparticles bearing positron-emitting radio tracers for PET imaging of neurobiological events in the living human brain. And this is my little dream, and I put myself there in the middle of the dream. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, any question? Maybe I have uh, a very general question, because you say that, uh, for example, uh, nanotechnology drug can, uh, can help a PET. But, uh, for example, PET can uh, help drug delivery? PET can help what? Drug delivery, for example, to, to, to visualize a carrier and so on. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I know that there are the li limits for the tracer, because there is yes. a very short... Uh, Time. Yes, but the thing oh, that's that right. Um, it, it can help drug delivery, and it helps in drug design. Um, every Tuesday, well, I'll go back a step. When I went to the pet center the first time, I met a radiochemist named Anthony G. He had been very, very headhunted to work in Aarhus at the new pet center. And we worked together for about seven years, and then Glaxo in London headhunted Tony G, and now he's the global head of pet research for Glaxo. Every Tuesday, they own the pet center in Aarhus to test their new compounds for drug delivery. So that's a very important aspect of what pet can do. Um, but I want to go even further and take the things that don't go in, in with nanoparticles. So um, it can go both ways. We can do whole body scans. We can do this. We can do that. But there's so many drugs that don't go through. We've got to get them in there. And uh, there are also some prob problems concerning the toxicity uh, when we work on patients. Um, you mean with the PET scanning? Yeah. No. No. The doses are so small. If you get a good specific activity, you're down around one microgram of compound and it goes right through. That's not a problem. Any question? Yes. Uh, is it possible to perform double labeling uh, of the same brain with two different uh, probes, like, for instance, mitazepine, and uh, to test the metabolic activity using glucose, for instance, and to have an overlapping of this information. You'd like to do it at the same time simultaneously? No, 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 not the same time, maybe in different times, but only, uh, in order to have the same information on, on the same brain, let's say. Yes, uh, Dr. Messina, we do that all the time. You can put the animal or the human in the scanner and do three or four scans. Carbon-11 decays quite quickly, so if you wait like one hour, you can do the next injection. Um, glucose is a f a f often fluorine labeled, FDG. That has a slower decay, but you can make it with oxygen, and that decays in two minutes. So you can do three, four, five scans in the same person or animal in sequence. We do it all the time. Any question? Yes. Actually, <clears throat> thank you very much for this uh, presentation. This is not a question. It's, it's going to be more, much more like a comment because we, we do have something that may take form with the PET analysis with cancer. 
And the problem that we are facing, we, we, we all know it's not a, basically a problem to encapsulate something into nanoparticles. However, the time it takes to encapsulate, it's quite long. It's maybe like one or maybe two days for the whole process to take place and to have this uh, enhanced to be used. And this is the problem that we are facing because you are dealing with uh, markers that have a sh very short period of life, uh, I don't know, a few hours or so. So I think that the reflection should be on can we change the, the way that we, we, we will make the particles in order to be able to, uh, to help you. And definitely... I hope that we will be able to help you soon. And uh, from what I say, maybe not solid nanoparticles, but maybe lipid nanoparticles may be, may be a, a, a solution. And definitely also uh, polymeric micelles might be something that we may, we may uh, need and uh, use for this uh, application. Okay. I don't have the right answer okay. to uh, any of your questions. The way I so see it. I see nanoparticles with a surface that will bind these PET tracers. And the PET tracers will be bound by one set of atom systems, and the other set will hit the enzymes so that you can do your receptors and your enzymes with the surface bound PET tracers. Maybe then it's a question I will turn to, uh, to Giovanni about this because maybe the, the answer would be like the click chemistry to do so, so that you would do like particles that would be covered with uh, something that can be clicked on and to get the, the drug or the tracer directly to this. That, that might be another answer to your question. I agree with you. It could be a great idea. Um, maybe uh, area to, 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 to study in details how to do this click chemistry because uh, there is a problem also in stability when you inject, uh, which is quite important. But uh, if you study uh, with all the criticism, I, I think click chemistry with decorated nanoparticles could be the, the answer for maybe ma magic nanobullets. <laughs> Donald. Other questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Smith. <laughs>